Hello, well thank you for joining me this afternoon. This is the final session in a series uh, focusing on nutritional support of anorexic cats. So in some of the previous sessions, we've talked about when to start nutritional support and tactics for doing so, including placement of feeding tubes. And today we're gonna to start with the, the, the feeding tube placed, but then what happens next? How do we calculate our nutritional requirements? How do we achieve uh, safe support via tube feeding in our cats? So your tube may have been placed either nasoesophageal, uh, which was, was one of our weeks, or an esophagostomy tube, which was uh, a different week, or indeed a gastrostomy tube, which I've not covered specifically in this series, um, but is something that can be helpful, uh, particularly for cats that have problems with their esophaguses. And we need to bypass that, for example, a cat with megaesophagus or a cat where we're wanting to feed, uh, you know, through a really large bore tube, a really... Um, specific diet which we worry about putting down a smaller tube. I think that that is less and less the case. There are better esophagostomy tubes around now that can facilitate that. Uh, but the cat shown on this slide here is actually a cat with chronic kidney disease where we knew we wanted really long-term support uh, and we were feeding a, a liquidized kidney diet uh, via that tube. So starting with the assumption that we've placed our tube, uh, the first question really is when can we start using our tube? Um, the advantage of a nasoesophageal tube is that we place, we can place these in a completely conscious cat and therefore we can start feeding straight away. Um, of course, if it is placed under anaesthesia or sedation, we need to wait for the patient to recover. But if you place it as I presented in an earlier session in a completely conscious cat, then you can start feeding instantly. With an esophagostomy tube, uh, we need to wait for our patient to recover from their general anaesthetic before we start to use that tube. And the biggest delay is for cats where we place a gastrostomy tube. And that's because this tube is going through the skin and the peritoneal membrane into the stomach. And so therefore one of the concerns is uh, leakage and inflammation around that stoma site. And we definitely don't want to have peritonitis. So it's recommended that we wait um, certainly 12 hours before before putting anything down the tube and then start with a little bit of water uh, and then move on to feeding. And these can be extremely well tolerated. So I hope I'm not putting you off using them, but we just need to be that a little bit more careful. So having decided uh, when we're going to start feeding, of course, the next thing is what are we going to put down our tube? And for those tubes that are narrow bore, it has to be a liquid food. Um, and the good thing is that there are a number of commercially available liquid foods that we can use. And the one that I'm most familiar with using in the UK is the, the Royal Cannon range, uh, which includes their recovery liquid, which is a, a general uh, convalescent support liquid, but they also have in a renal form form for cats with chronic kidney disease and these are both formulated so that you can attach your syringe to to the bottle the the lid has a, a syringe size nod, nozzle hole on it uh, that you can attach your syringe to and it's a, a calorie uh, per mil which makes your calculations extremely easy as we'll move on to in the next session some of you may have different products available to you. Certainly, I know Clinicare is often used in North America. It's not something that I've had experience of. And I think in the UK, there are problems with its availability. I did try and do some investigations earlier this week uh, and couldn't find it uh, available to order in the UK at the moment. But uh, there may be other options that also you have available to you. And then there are also um, a number of other options that we can use, which include foods that also are suitable for offering directly. Um, and uh, whilst the Royal Canin recovery and renal, you can put in a saucer and offer to a cat. It's, it's not very common that the cat will choose to lap it up. Whereas, of course, products like Hills AD, which you'll be very familiar with, also the Purina convalescent diet are designed to be offered as a food uh, to, your, to your cat or dog. And Royal Canin also make a powder which can be reconstituted and I've included some information here about how many calories you, you have per mil with each of these. So with the Hills AD if you have a whole tin of Hills AD and you add 25 mils of water because it's quite a soft food anyway that will make it a syringable consistency and that's just over a calorie per mil. 
with raw canning convalescence powder. If you add 50 grams of that to 125 mils of water, that creates a liquid with uh, 1.4 kilocalories per mil. And then the Purina CN diet, if you dilute that one to one, so a tin of Purina CN with another tin of water added to it, um, that creates uh, 0.65 kilocalories per mil. Um, Purina also suggests that you do sieve that before passing through a tube. And with all of these, it's probably sensible um, with the things that are not liquids as they arrive at your clinic um, to use them for patients with larger uh, bore tubes, so 14 French and above would be a, a sensible sort of guideline. If in doubt, definitely use the liquid ones because they are not going to block your tube, which clearly is extremely frustrating if that does happen. The next question is how much do you need to, to feed? And this should be based uh, as a starting point on resting energy requirements. And there are a number of equations that are used for calculation of resting energy requirements. Um, and the resting energy requirements are basically just the number of calories our patient needs to exist in a thermoneutral environment. So they do not allow for any activity, which is fine for our patients uh, within the hospital, um, but are designed really just to be a baseline level of, of nutritional support for our patient. So you can see there are, there are three different equations on this slide, uh, 30 times body weight, and then add 70, or the body weight to the power 0.75, times 70, which is considered to be, uh, I think, the most accurate. Um, or very handily, I would say you can use this very, very rough guide, which is 50 kilocalories per kilo of body weight per day. <clears throat> and that's not too tricky a one to remember. And actually for our cats, it's uh, surprisingly accurate. So this uh, table shows body weight ranging from 3.5 kilos to 5 kilos. And you can see the accurate calculation of resting energy requirements compared to the estimate using that 50 kilocalories per kilo. And you can see that particularly for the, the lower body weights is actually remarkably uh, similar between the two. So a four kilo cat, uh, accurate requirements, 198 kilocalories per day. Uh, the estimate version gives you 200 so it is pretty much uh, accurate and it's only as the cat gets larger that you, you get a little bit of disparity um, but in in reality probably still clinically acceptable for our patients in, in the hospital so um, way back in an earlier presentation, I did in introduce Ralph as a case. He's a cat with a pyothorax, very, very sick, dyspneic, uh, very unwell cat at presentation. And he is the sort of candidate uh, for a nasoesophageal tube because uh, he, he would be too risky a patient to anaesthetize with his pyothorax. And indeed, that is what we did. We placed a nasoesophageal tube, as you can see in this photo. And I'm just gonna use him as an example for our calculations. And he's very little cat. He's a little Rex cat. He weighed 2.8 kilos. So his resting energy requirements at this time are 152 calories. Royal Canin recovery liquid is one calorie per mil. So his daily requirements are 152 mils of that Royal Canin recovery liquid. And um, first key point to remember about this is that we're not going to obviously give that just in one dose. Um, we are going to split it into meals. But secondly, we're also going to start off more gently. We're not going to give all of the nutritional requirements on the first day because there is a concern that that just is not going to be well tolerated. He's more likely to suffer from nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and we, we want to avoid those sorts of complications. Um, and some other key points would be that we want to pass um, food and, and water down that tube at a, a tepid sort of temperature, which means um, a little bit below body temperature, but certainly uh, a little bit warmer than they would be uh, if sitting at room temperature and definitely warmer than fridge temperature. So we have a choice. We can start at 25% of resting energy requirements. Um, and if we do that, then for Ralph, that's just 38 mils of food on the first day. And I would suggest that on the first day, the first few days, you start with having six meals a day rather than fewer than that, because again, that is likely to be better tolerated. So that's about six meals of food per meal. And then we want to flush the tube uh, with water before and after 
after each meal, five to 10 mils. Um, so for Ralph, that would be, uh, I would start with uh, use a larger volume on this first day because he's having such a tiny amount of food. Um, and so he would have, uh, if he tolerates it well, 10 mils of water before the food, his six mil uh, of food, and then another 10 mil to flush. So about 26 mils, which uh, should be well tolerated by him. The next day we would increase to a third of resting energy requirements and indeed you could start with a third. Um, a lot of people uh, would do that and uh, in most cases that's perfectly well tolerated. And for Ralph that's 51 mils of food which split over six meals is eight and a half mils per feed. And again five to ten mils flush either side so a slightly larger volume of food. Um, and then if that's well tolerated the next day we go to two thirds of resting energy requirements which for Ralph is 100 mils of food in total spread over six meals so that's 17 mils uh, per uh, meal we can probably reduce our flush size now to five mils of water either side of that food so it's a slightly larger meal that we're we're building up and then from the next day thereafter ideally 100 percent of our nutritional requirements Again, initially in six meals, so for Ralph that's about 25 mils of food per meal flushed with five mils of water either side. So he's going to have 35 mils in a meal, which is a little bit bigger than that uh, total meal size that I, I've put here of uh, five to 10 mils per kilo. But um, it's actually by this point, usually the tolerance is, is much better and we can increase the volume to what's a more normal amount for a cat to have in a meal. And indeed, in the following days, it should po be possible to reduce the number of meals to perhaps three or four meals per day and increase the volume of uh, food fed at each meal. <clears throat> The, the stomach capacity, the gastric capacity, um, is often in textbooks quoted to be 40 mils per kilo. So a full stomach for Ralph would be 112 mils. But indeed, with his nutritional requirements of 150 mils per day, we're probably not going to be proposing to put more than 50 mils of food in his stomach per meal. So you can see it's well within that and it uh, should be well tolerated, indeed was well tolerated for him. And of course, with individual patients, you can play around a little bit with the frequency of meals and the size of the meals going forward to suit the cat and to suit the owner. If this is a cat with perhaps an esophagostomy tube that is going to return home Home for long term management. Important also to continue to weigh our patient, make sure that we are providing uh, adequate nutrition for them. So we may need to increase above our original calculations um, and particularly as our patients are more active and they gain weight, um, their resting energy requirements will increase and, and obviously we need to support that. What are the sort of common problems that we might see? Well, they do include, sadly, as depicted in the photograph here, tube removal, cats that either manage to hoik the tube out of their nose or, or perhaps regurgitate the tube out of, out of their nose. And that can be an extremely frustrating situation to deal with. Uh, tubes also can block, um, hence the caution recommended earlier in terms of what you put down the tube. Um, and in terms of unblocking tubes, there are things you can try. So um, Coca-Cola is often quoted um, and uh, just instilling some Coca-Cola in the tube and, and hoping that might break things down. Uh, also, you could try pancreatic enzymes mixed with water, um, cranberry juice, I've heard uh, quoted as well. But often, particularly with these very narrow tubes, the sort of nasal tubes, uh, once the tube blocks, it is really the end of the tube and you just need to replace it. And, and it's better to just get on with that. So tube unclogging, you can try, but I would say it's, it's not often very rewarding. The speed of the meal um, can cause um, nausea in some cats, particularly if they are feeling nauseous anyway. So observe the cat as you, feel, as you feed it. And if you do see signs of nausea, if the cat looks uncomfortable or starts to drool or vocalise, then stop that meal and back off. You can, of course, choose to, to do more of a continuous infusion of food if you have uh, facilities to do so. And that might be better tolerated by some cats. Diarrhea um, also you can see as a consequence of just the, the cat that's not eaten and then suddenly is providing with relatively rich food. Um, but, you know, I, I'd say not 
terribly common as a consequence. Um, poor motility can be an issue with some cats and metoclopramide infusions can be useful in stimulating um, activities. So a constant rate infusion of one to two milligrams per kilogram per day, for example, uh, can be effective in supporting those sorts of cases. Stomacyte infection for esophagostomy and gastrostomy tubes can be a problem, but it's not terribly common, probably most often seen in those cats that have underlying health problems or on medication that perhaps uh, immunosuppresses them to some extent. Um, but many cats will tolerate their tubes very well. And probably the only other thing to really uh, mention before we finish is just don't forget to offer food to these cats voluntarily because having a tube does not prevent the cat from being able to eat. And of course, we want to, where possible, use the tube support as a short term measure. So remove them as soon as, as we can see that the cat is eating adequately. So in summary, uh, nutritional support definitely can make a huge difference to our patients. It really can be life and death. Nasoesophageal tubes have the advantage of being easy to place in a conscious cat and you can instantly provide support, but they're not as well tolerated for long term support. And of course, we are a bit more limited in the foods that we can put down them. Esophagostomy tubes tend to be the go to ones that I would use for medium to long term support because they're very well tolerated. They're larger diameter, so they're less likely to block, much more flexible in terms of what you can put down there. Um, and uh, therefore it, better in terms of the long term for our patients. So as usual, there are some additional resources that you can refer to on the website, including previous presentations. If you've not already heard these, look in the 10 minute tips section of the video downloads page, uh, video tutorials page rather. Um, and uh, a final note just about um, some surveys that we have open at the moment. So we're still, um, we've got our survey on remote consultations. This is phone and video consultations because of COVID social distancing. So if you've uh, not had a chance to to complete that yet it's going to be open for just a few more days and if you have colleagues who you think might be interested in completing it for us I would be so grateful we're just trying to get as many uh, people as possible having completed this and similarly uh, the remote consultation survey we have for carers as well is just going to stay open for a few more days um, and uh, if you have already completed these uh, I would like to take this opportunity to say thank you very very much indeed. So I hope that's been helpful. Um, thank you very much. And uh, also just lastly to say that uh, 10 Minute Tips will return. This is the end of this series for now, but we'll keep you posted on new ones. It'll probably be January now. Everything tends to get quite busy in the run up to Christmas, but I hope you will uh, come back and listen to me then. Thank you very much.